Okay, great. I think we're ready to ready to roll. There will be more people joining, I'm sure, as in the next in the next few minutes, especially. So thank you for coming to our free webinar, which is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It's more of a Q&A about uh, best practices to get visibility and be, be in the LinkedIn 1% with me and uh, our guest, Jennifer Rotner. First, I want to cover uh, some basic things before I introduce Jennifer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to explain a little bit about Pika and wish Pika happy birthday because today is Pika's fourth birthday. It was four years ago today, yay, <laughs> four years ago today that Pika launched. And uh, so for those of you that don't know anything about Pika, I'm going to give you the short 60 second version. So Pika was founded by uh, me and two other independent consultants when I discovered that there was no single place to go for help when it came to launching or growing your own independent, uh, your independent consulting business. And so I reached out to my two friends and I said, hey, I got this idea for this educational organization and community where people can get help and the, the help they need and get their questions answered and help each other out with growing their own independent consulting practices. And thankfully my two friends said, yeah, we should do it. So it took two years, two years to launch Pika, uh, but then we did launch on 420 day uh, four years ago. I remember the day well, because I was living in San Francisco at the time and 420 day in San Francisco is usually a pretty big deal. <laughs> so Pika is four years old today and uh, we're steadily growing. We've helped over 800 people, uh, not necessarily as full members, but sometimes we get people who come to our webinars, like we have one that says, is independent consulting the right path for me? Uh, and that's basically where I try to talk people out of becoming an independent consultant because it's not the right path for everybody. But in any case, that's a little bit about Pika and uh, there'll be a little bit more at the end of our session today. So just so some quick housekeeping rules. By default, you're on mute, but you certainly don't have to be. At all Pika events, we like them to be more interactive and particularly this one, because it's basically a conversation with Jennifer to pick her brain. So I'll be monitoring the, the chat, but we also encourage you just to come off mute and ask questions live and make it as interactive as possible. We are recording the session as the Zoom voice told you when you joined, and uh, we will be sharing the notes and the recording to anybody who signed up for the workshop. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce our guest today, Jennifer Rotner. So Jennifer is the founder and CEO of Elite Creative, which is actually the umbrella of her two businesses, Elite Editing and Elite Authors. So Elite Editing is a full service firm that provides proofreading, editing, writing for companies of all sizes, from small businesses and nonprofits to Fortune 500 companies. And 10 years into that business, Jennifer discovered the need for her second business, which is Elite Authors. So Elite Authors provides a full suite of publishing services basically everything a writer needs in one place to get their book published. Uh, they provide a supportive streamlined process that makes publishing your book easy and profitable. And they've helped more than 10,000 people bring their books to market. And they work with all kinds of writers, including solopreneurs like people in the Pika community. So she knows a lot about uh, being an independent woman and starting her own business and uh, working with solopreneurs, independent consultants. So I'm very excited to have you here today, Jennifer. Is there I'm anything sure. anything else you'd like to add about your businesses? No, thank you. You did an amazing job. I, I wish I could have you always introduce me. That was perfect. <laughs> it helps to have notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, let me um, just start out with a very basic question. Like, what, what does it mean to be in the LinkedIn 1% and why does it matter? Sure. And I would just want to apologize to everyone. I'm, I'm short of voice a little bit today, so I'll, I'll do my best to project, but let me know if you can you always hear me okay. Um, but yeah, I love this topic and I'm so excited to talk about this today. Um, so what it means to be in the LinkedIn 1%, and it's actually a, a phenomenon across all social media. Um, that there's this rule, there's this accepted truth in social media, which is called the 1% rule or the 99-1 rule. Um, there's lots of names for it, but basically the idea is um, people on social, me on social media are made up of three types. There's 
the 90% that are essentially the lurkers, right? And that's, that's, I got to own, that's what I am on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm there to get information. I'm there to read others' content. I'm a taker. Um, I receive that information. I'm not that much of a, of a giver in those ways. And then there's the 9% that would be considered contributors. Those are the folks who on LinkedIn or Facebook might share when they get married, have a baby, graduate, when the big things happen in their lives, when they get a promotion or a new job, win an award, and you want to share that, that those are contributors, um, folks who are putting stuff out every once in a while. And then there's that golden 1%. That 1%, those are the creators. Um, that's true across all social media, but on LinkedIn more than any other place, this, the creators, there's still place at the top for, for creators. LinkedIn is still looking to garner creators because LinkedIn is a, is a content uh, heavy platform. It's a platform that's completely user generated. So LinkedIn as a platform really needs our organic content. And, um, and only 1% of the, I think it's something like three quarters of a billion people on LinkedIn. If you think about the fact that only 1% of them are considered creators, you really can see that there's just a huge opportunity for organic content. And what I mean by organic, just um, maybe to preemptively answer a question there is, uh, you know, there's, there's paid media, there's paid content, that's ads, those are sponsored pieces, all of the things you see across different social media. Um, that's what's going to work really well on the more mature platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. They have matured into a place where paid content is really the way to go in order to make an impact. But LinkedIn's still young. It's still young and there's still a lot of opportunity. There's still a lot of green space for thought leaders to become creators. And, um, and I'm just going to start off by saying something. I don't know you guys. I don't know everybody on this call, but I can tell you without a doubt you are all thought leaders. You all went into your own consultancy. You all started your own businesses because you have an expertise in something and really focusing on that expertise and sharing it and giving your experiences is what would make you a thought leader on LinkedIn. So um, digging deep into that and sharing that in, in, in the form of organic content on LinkedIn is just such an opportunity. Um, so when I'm talking to to CEOs and executives, which I'm doing pretty much all day long of companies, large and small. I, we talk about all sorts of content because that's what we do at Elite. So we talk about SEO content. We talk about thought leadership pieces, uh, books, ghostwriting, marketing pieces, case studies, white papers, you name it. We write all of it and touch all of it. But when I'm asked, what's the one thing you recommend having in your marketing plan, or what's the one thing you recommend us do right now? I say, get on LinkedIn, get your CEO on LinkedIn, get yourselves on LinkedIn. There is green space there. There's opportunity and it won't be like that forever. So that's my, my biggest tip across the board for folks. So that's why you, you suggest LinkedIn versus other social media channels. Absolutely. I think making an impact on the more mature channels, which by mature, I mean age, I mean iteration. I don't mean in terms of types of content. Um, the more mature channels have... Um, they don't have as much room for organic content and organic content is free, right? It's just, it takes your time and your resources and your energy to create, but you don't have to pay for it on, on Facebook or Instagram. For example, if you want to uh, make inroads in any real way, your, your marketing strategy has to include paid. Um, it's just, it's, it, it's practically impossible these days to garner much of a following without that because of how their algorithm is set up. Um, LinkedIn, as I said, the platform needs us. It needs content creators. So if you start posting regularly, just even if you're, you know, all right, I'm just going to set myself a goal for 90 days. I'm going to post three times a week, which is what we recommend to people. I know that sounds like a lot. Um, I, I used to say every day, but I know that scares people. So let's say you post three times a week. You are alerting LinkedIn's algorithm that you are a creator. And LinkedIn will naturally then treat you differently than the rest of the people. It will naturally prop you up. It'll naturally give you more impressions and put you in front of more people because it needs you. It needs that 1%. Um, so there's just so much opportunity if, if you do it consistently. Um, and, and just if you think about your own experience on LinkedIn, even if right now you're, you're a lurker, which is totally fine, I bet every time you go in, you know, with your cup of coffee and do your morning scroll through LinkedIn, if you're like me, 
I go on every morning, just to kind of see what's, what's going on. I see the same 15 to 20 people in my feed every morning. That's not because they've requested that. That's not because of, of, you know, the power of their words. Maybe they're really amazing at what they're writing, but that's because they have shown LinkedIn that they are a contributor and LinkedIn puts them at the top of your feed. And probably within each of your networks, there's probably not more than 15 to 20 people that are contributing at that level. So they get that prime real estate in front of you every single day, just by, just by consistently posting. And uh, there's room, there's room at the top. Well, posting three times a week sounds like a lot. And Nancy had a question in the chat too. So what type of content? Like is yeah. it articles, newsletters? Um, Great question. What, Great question. What, what, what do we pose? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a really great question. And, and a lot of it has to do with kind of figuring out your own, um, your own topics of interest, your own thought leadership, and, and really digging into those. But in terms of types of content, um, I think the more it's, it's always, it should be focused. The content you put out should be focused on your audience, right? So maybe identifying who is the audience I'm trying to reach, who's my target audience, whether it's for, if you're hiring, talking to people about your organization, if you are looking to get jobs, get speaking engagements, get work, um, who is your ideal client, right? Identifying first, who is that persona that I'm talking to? And before I even get into content, which I'll definitely, it's a great question. One thing to know about LinkedIn, which is different than every other network, you can reach out to those exact people. You can, you can reverse engineer your audience on LinkedIn. So when you do that work, which you can do with LinkedIn Simple Search, they've got great, um, their Simple Search unpaid search options are really, really top notch. So even if you don't have Sales Navigator or other things, you can say, I want to talk to, I want to be in front of every CEO or executive director um, in, you know, the IT industry in the, the Washington DC metro area. And you can plug that into LinkedIn and you can get those people in front of you. LinkedIn will let you connect with them. And connecting is such a, a low touch thing to do. And the second that you connect with them, they're giving you permission for you to put your content in front of them. So when you then write a piece about, Hey, yesterday I met with a client who was having these three pain points and I sat with them and we created a plan or three months ago, I met with this client. And yesterday he told me that, um, we've really solved their problems. We've really helped them streamline their efforts. I'm so proud of what we're doing. Um, sharing your experience in a way that really speaks to that audience is so powerful and getting in front of them every day is something that you can do without a significant amount of effort. Um, so that's, that's just a creating the right landscape. Now, in terms of content, I think really varying it up is super important. Uh, you don't just want to send people to blog posts and articles all the time, but I certainly think, you know, within a month, two or three posts that send people to valuable articles or to your own blog is really, really great. The key with LinkedIn there is sharing the information within the platform. So it's not just like, I wrote a really great article, go here to read it. It's here's an article I wrote and here are the five key takeaways. It's putting the value of that article or post in, in, in your post for LinkedIn. It's giving people that information. It's all about giving it away for free. Your goal on LinkedIn should not be to tease people out or to send them to your website. It should be to give away free advice, to give away information, to help improve their business life in some way, shape or form. Other things to share are experiences, like I said, a time you helped a client or a challenge that you or a colleague had and how you overcame it. Um, certainly things that are going on in your industry, talking about current events or, or ways that you're involved um, and sharing any wins, sharing stories. Um, really, LinkedIn is a storytelling platform and you can break it down in a lot of different ways. But when you kind of figure out what your story is, then you can plug in all of these other pieces of content to serve it. So Jennifer, we had a couple of people in the chat say, well, how do you, how do you do these types of posts without it coming across as, as boasting or me, me, yeah. me, look at the great stuff I'm doing. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, most of us are, are a little bit inhibited about that. I agree. I agree. I am that way as well. I really had 
it was a struggle for me to dip my toe into LinkedIn because I, when I started my company, I didn't even have my picture. I don't even, Elite Authors has my picture. I don't even know if, I don't think Elite Editing still has my picture (laughs) on my website 13 years later. So I really like to be behind the camera. I'm a photographer, right? I like to be behind the camera. I like to be the quiet, unseen person. Um, even, even getting up in front of folks like today, this is something that I, I push myself to do because I find value in it and I love to share, but I, I'm not naturally someone who, who wants to sit here and talk about how great my company is or, or, or brag in any way that doesn't feel authentic to me. That doesn't feel good to me. So I worked really hard to hone in on what that voice is for myself. And we do that with all of our clients. How can we talk about you and celebrate what you offer? without it feeling braggy. Um, and the answer is, you're, if you share, if you, as I said, freely share with people and give them this information, um, then it won't ever feel like bragging. I certainly, I look for ways to talk about my company in terms of celebrating my team and celebrating their wins. Um, I love to talk about our clients. I love to talk about how we help them. I love to talk about the challenges that I run into as a leader. And, and what has humbled me and what has made me stumble because I hope that those lessons will be valuable to others. Certainly when we have successes, you know, I have to work really hard not to be like, we're the greatest, <laughs> you know? Um, but Liz and I actually met because we both of our businesses made the Inc. 5,000. Um, we've made amazing connections. I've made amazing connections because of that. That's something that we want to celebrate. So in, in leaning into something like that, if you win an award, you want to say it loud and proud, but there's ways to do it that aren't, look how great we are. It's look what great company we're in. Look what we overcame over the last couple of years. Um, one of the messages that I really focus on with the Inc. 5000 messages, it, we, we won in, 420, in 2021 for 2020. And while I'm so proud of that growth, what I was most proud of was that we had 100% retention of our full-time employees. That's what I focused on right? Not just the win, the win is great, but, but I focus on the fact that our team stayed together and we stayed true to our values. And, and that I think speaks highly of the company, but not in a way that's braggy, if that makes sense. Um, so trying to find your own authentic voice that allows you to do that, I think is, is really key. And what about the trade-off though? I mean, a lot of us have business pages on LinkedIn and so, you know, we have a business and then we have our personal profile how do we juggle that? Absolutely. And I get that question from people all the time, you know, can't we just hire you to write for our business? And I say no to that. And that's not, we won't also write for your business. We absolutely think your businesses, your business pages should be thriving. Business page is a great place to be also a little bit more braggy, like just a splashy, we won this award. Um, You can do that more on a business page than personal. But the really, the key about LinkedIn and the key about connection is we're all more apt to connect with another human than we are with a business. So on a human level, that's important, but also LinkedIn knows that. And therefore they don't give as much um, clout from an algorithmic perspective. They don't give as much clout to the business pages. So if you ran an experiment tomorrow, and I've had seen people do this many times where you post personally a post and you post almost the exact same thing in your business, you will find that you get exponentially more impressions than your business did. Um, That's on purpose. And that's because LinkedIn is propping up other humans. They want to see it's, it's meant to be a place for connection and people want to hear from you, the business owner, the, the, the speaker of the, of the company more than they want to hear from the company themselves. So while it's really valuable in terms of the whole content landscape to have things up on your, on your company page, the real important place to be is writing from your own profile. So would you suggest though, like let's take Pika for example. So Pika has a, a page on LinkedIn where we post about our events or we post you know, new blog articles, whatever. Would you suggest that I as the founder of Pika then forward that comment or should I just comment on it? Both, I think, I think like any other place, it's good to have a healthy mix. You don't want it to be that you're posting for Pika and then just you know, resharing what Pika shares. You want, you want it all to kind of fit together in a landscape. So posting for Pika, Pika might be a really great place. If if you and I were sitting and doing a content strategy for that, it might be a great place to highlight, um, you know, member profiles, like every week, highlight a particular member, talk about the events, talk about, 
you know, Pico's birthday. And then that might be something that you pull out and say, and then with your own personal share, not just a reshare, Hey, happy birthday, Pika. But when I started this company four years ago, I had no idea what it would become. I'm amazed at how we've helped nearly a thousand people start their businesses. Um, I'm, you know, sharing testimonials about it for, you know, resharing that post with your own personal take, making it personal is what's going to make it more than just a copy and paste, right? So the, the two profiles playing off each other is really important. Um, and then when people see, oh, you're talking about Pika, that sounds really cool. That sounds like an organization I'd be interested in. Then when they go to the, the company profile, they see all this other great stuff that you're doing. They see all these events available to them. So in, in an ideal world, they should complement one another. So you're saying I should both comment on the actual post and then forward it with something personal to my yes. own my own connection. Yeah, absolutely. And not everything, right? You don't want to just every single time you post something for Pika, you don't want to reshare it. You want to do that every once in a while. Um, you want the two to be independent of one another, but also find ways to complement one another. So somebody had a question in the chat about why would I want to have a LinkedIn business page versus just my website? That's a great question. And a lot of it depends on what your business is. Um, so much is turning to social media and, and there's so many, there's so many changes in, um, in Google and in, you know, websites with, with cookies and all this stuff that's happening where websites not saying they're not important. I, we put a tremendous amount of weight on our website, certainly. And we put a lot of investment in SEO and other things, but it's changing. And, and a lot of people spend their time looking for businesses, looking for people to connect with within these, um, within these silos like LinkedIn, where people are, you know, people might just go to Pika's company page and see enough to say, okay, I want to, I want to engage with them. Then they go to the website and then they can engage more, but so much is happening there that you want to be able to reach people wherever they are. And right now there's just so much engagement on LinkedIn. I think it's a really important place to be. Setting up a company page is not hard. It, you know, it's sitting down and saying, all right, I'm gonna take an hour, I'm gonna make this happen. I know that's not easy because everybody has busy days, but it's worth doing. Um, even if you don't contribute to that page significantly, if you're deciding where to put your time, I highly, highly recommend you put it into your personal profile and your personal posting on LinkedIn. But having a company page is very valuable. Um, I can also tell you that um, I obviously, I, I post very differently for myself than we do for elite editing and elite authors. But when I personally post like a job post, I'll go into some groups that I'm in of, we hire a lot of freelance writers and editors. So I'll go into a group of freelance writers and editors and I'll say, hey, elite is hiring. I'll drop a link. I, it's unbelievable to me. Recently I did that. And I saw that my company page followership grew 600 people in one day. So just by me personally posting, people looked at it. They went to the company page, not the website. The website saw a ding, you know, a, a, an increase in traffic that day too. But my LinkedIn page, company page saw a, a dramatic increase in one day of people saying, oh, I want to see what this company is talking about. Um, where they, you know, they, they wanted to get more involved. So really, again, it all kind of plays in together. So actually that brings up one of my questions, which was about, which is about groups. Are, are groups, like you used it to post that you had open positions. Okay, that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me, but are, do people still participate in LinkedIn groups? Is there any Great. value of us Great participating in, in, uh, in these groups that we belong in? I think the answer is sometimes. I think that as LinkedIn evolved, they moved away from groups as a way to get people engaged. So a lot of the groups are pretty legacied. You don't see as much, you see, I mean, a fraction of the level of engagement groups that you once saw. But if someone is in a group, when you post in that group, it shows in their feed. So I only really use it for, um, for things like job postings, that I think I really wanna bump up engagement for. I will say though, that there still are pockets where groups are very active. So if you kind of search within your own industry, you may find that there are some groups that are really, really, really engaged, really active. There's good conversations going. Um, usually it's you know within a group where people are giving each other support and sharing. That may be a great place 
to post, that may be a great place to say, Hey guys, I just, you know, I just wrote this article or, or check out my post and link to it. Um, I think this would be valuable here, but again, it's not about pushing any sort of business agenda. If you're sharing something that's really bringing value to people, it'll be, it'll be thought of that way and people will be grateful for it. If you're just posting like, Hey, you guys should use my services. That's going to die on the vine on a group page. So with regarding groups would, would, I think maybe it also depends on your objective, right? Are you looking to network with other independent consultants or are you looking to find your target client, right? Because yes. there's different types of groups. Absolutely. And, and, and kind of searching around there um, is always a good idea. I will say though, in general groups, it, it, that may change as, as you know, LinkedIn continues to evolve, but at the moment, it's definitely not a place where there's a lot of um, hub activity. I think that's happening now within people's individual networks and on their feeds. So that's why, again, that kind of posting very regularly, putting up content very regularly, that's going to be valuable to people. That's going to speak to their needs is the way to go. So I understand now that, and thank you, Nancy, for writing this in, that now LinkedIn makes it possible for us to publish our own newsletters within mm -hmm. their platform. Yep. So for example, I follow one called, I think it's Paul Estes and the gig economy. Yep. What do you think about uh, creating your own newsletter on LinkedIn versus using MailChimp or Constant Contact or something like that? Yeah, again, I think this has a lot to do with, um, with where your audience is or who they are. If you have a really great, robust um, you know, set of emails, that a set of contacts that you can reach out to, that's wonderful. I think LinkedIn was really smart in doing this because it allows people to engage with a new audience. Um, I'll take a step back there and say the most important thing, the most important thing is posting regularly. I'm going to... Gonna, that's, that's the thing you're going to hear the most from me. But the second important thing, second most important thing to do is build your audience, which as I said, you can create these targeted searches. You can look for exactly who you want your message to get in front of. And once you do that, you have all sorts of different ways to engage with them. And, and a newsletter is, is just another way. Um, it's a more curated way. You can really phone in on your messaging. Um, but in terms of, I don't like people to get too, to get too grandiose, because as soon as you start to think I'm going to do all of these different things, it can feel overwhelming. And after two or three weeks, you might stop. So I'm really into start with what's digestible, start with what's chunkable. If you're not posting regularly on LinkedIn, do that. Um, create yourself a workflow for what you're going to do every day to keep this successful and keep this sustainable. Another piece of that is Go to that search, go to that targeted search. Let's say you come, you, you target everyone down, you see there's a, a thousand people, or let's make it easier, 3,000 people um, that fit your targeted search. Every single day, you go to that same search and you connect with as many people as it'll allow you. The algorithm is slightly different depending on, on who you are and, and your engagement with the platform. But on average, LinkedIn allows you to connect with 500 people a month or about 125 people a week. So either every day, go in there, do this for two minutes or twice a week, you go in, connect with all of these people, grow your network. So instead of trying to put out there and say, sign up for my newsletter on your website and put those signups everywhere, grow your network on LinkedIn. Network, LinkedIn will easily let you go from a couple hundred contacts to thousands upon thousands of contacts. Um, and do that every day, get in front of the audience you want to be in front of, and then post regularly. Use your, your, I always recommend before you even start a newsletter, unless that's like, you know, something you absolutely know you want to do, use your, use your daily posts as a way to test what's going to interest your audience. Um, we have people who come to us all the time, and Liz, you and I have talked about this, who are ready to write a book. Uh, but they don't really know what they want to write about. They want a book to help their business. And I, we're happy to help them there. But I often say, write some blogs, write some posts on LinkedIn, test your audience, see what they're reacting to. Um, use that as a testing ground or a proving ground for your content. And then let that feed into your newsletters, um, your books, your kind, of, your kind of larger, more curated pieces. LinkedIn as um, 
as just a daily organic writing, writing source is a great place to kind of see what do people like about what I'm saying? What's resonating? What should I build on? Um, what services are people really interested in? Or where is there a gap in the market? What people aren't talking about, which I might be able to fill. So using that time to play around, I think is really valuable. So uh, we have some questions coming in through the chat. Right. But are videos and articles still considered like the gold standard for LinkedIn content or are things changing? Not so much. Like, is it better to post like a little 10 second video of myself or here's an if, yeah. link if to you, an article? If you like to be in front of the camera, I mean, think about your own behavior on LinkedIn and on any social network. If you're scrolling, you probably stop when you see a face much more than you stop when you see a logo or a piece of art, right? You when you see a face, it's naturally more engaging. Again, us as humans, we connect with other humans. If you're comfortable in front of the camera, high production does not matter these days. People want authenticity. They want to hear from you. So just turning your phone around and giving people a quick update saying, here's what's happened. The craziest thing happened to me this morning. Um, I couldn't believe what my client told me. Or I couldn't believe what happened to my employee. I'm so excited about this. You know, putting those messages up there, that will do incredible, take incredible leaps in terms of your engagement. Um, I'm not someone who loves to do that. So my team pushes me to do it. So I understand if that's not your thing, but it's absolutely a, a hugely valuable thing you can do. Don't worry about production or editing. Just, you know, putting yourself out there is really great. In terms of articles, I do think that those still have value. They don't get as many impressions as posts for sure. So I, I know LinkedIn has kind of um, knocked articles down in terms of their own strategy in terms of their hierarchy. But I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. If you, if you write for your own blog posts, you can actually repost right now on LinkedIn without worrying about what's called cannibalization, meaning you don't have to rewrite everything. You can, you can post the same article and it's not going to hurt traffic to your website. And I think that's a value. I think the more you can put your stuff out there, the better. And LinkedIn gives you the opportunity to do that. So if you have long form posts, I would definitely put them on LinkedIn. Um, one thing that I know, Liz, we've talked about before, this is something that most people don't know, which is most people, you find an article that's really valuable on Inc or Forbes and you say, here's this great article. And if you do everything I just recommended, right? Which is, here's my five takeaways from this article. Here's why it was valuable to me. I'm sharing it in case it's valuable to you. The natural thing then to do is link to that article, right? Um, or link to your blog or link to other places. LinkedIn does not like that. <laughs> the algorithm really doesn't like that because they don't want people to leave their site. So as soon as you link externally, you immediately get dinged and you're going to have less impressions. Um, so, so a great thing to do there is link to a post on LinkedIn that's staying within their, their world. They want you to stay there. They want you to stay on site. Or what we do all the time is we'll, we'll write the, the value of the post in the post, as I said. And then at the bottom, we'll say, if you want to read the whole article, there's a link to the article in the first comment or a link to the article in comments. And then we'll link to it there. So again, our goal isn't to send people to our website. That's not why we're doing it. Our goal is to say, we wrote this really high valuable post. We wanted to share it with you. Um, here's my thoughts. Here's what I loved about this article or what I found valuable. If you want to read the rest of it, here it is. That keeps the reader happy and that keeps LinkedIn happy. Interesting. Going back to um, the video for, for a minute there, uh, Gabriella wrote that she's work, currently working on snackable content. I think that's sort of what we're talking about. It's like little bits and pieces mm -hmm. of content on a more frequent basis, ideally, ideally daily, if not three times, yeah. three times a yep. week, right? Uh, is there a recommendation for the length of a, one of those little videos you think? That's a, so, so there are best practices and I don't know them off the top of my head, so I would have to search them, but there are best practices for how long people stay engaged. There is a certain number of seconds that are recommended. Um, that's, that's all information that's very, very findable in the same way that there's an optimized number of, of words to use. You don't want to write a 500 word post. Um, you don't want to use 25 hashtags. You want to use three to five. There's all sorts of great best practices around these things. For video, I don't know the exact number, but I certainly know that's information that's findable. 
Um, but the answer is keeping it short. Someone's not going to sit and listen to a five minute video, but they are going to sit and listen to a 20 second one. So getting your points in there um, and sharing in chunks is a very good idea. And it also, you know, you can sit down and maybe not, not have to script a whole thing out, but record five or 10 at once and then put them in your content library and, and share them. Um, which brings me really quick to another great tip. I always want, I love, I love automating things. I love software. So I always look for takeaways like that when I attend webinars. Um, you don't have to post every day. You can use really great posting services. They exist. Many of them are free. Um, for individuals, Hootsuite's obviously the one everyone knows. I personally, for an individual, really like later.com. I don't know that that one's as known and I'm a, a big fan of later. We use a company called Sendable because we post on behalf of our clients. So we post for many, many clients at once and Sendable is really good for managing multi, um, you know, many accounts. But those are three that are worth looking at. I think again, for, for one channel, for one person later is free. Um, and that way you can make this, but my whole goal today is to make this feel um, achievable for everyone and not like this is such an overwhelming amount of work. So if you made a part of your monthly workflow, I'm going to spend this amount of time writing or taping or creating content. Um, and then I'm going to set it and forget it. You can absolutely do that. Take the time to just plug it into one of these sites and it will schedule for you and it will post for you. And then all you have to do is go in and comment and engage. So you mentioned, uh, there's one other comment in the, in the chat, but you just mentioned something about hashtags. Tell yes. us a little, little bit about where to put them, how many to use, why it's important to add them. Yeah, so a lot of people ask, should I use hashtags on, on LinkedIn? Is that more of a Twitter thing and what's trending? I think optimizing for the, for the platform you're on is always a good idea. And LinkedIn really uses hashtags well. Um, on Instagram, you know, I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like you can use up to 30 hashtags. I wouldn't do that here. I would keep it really light. It's all about sharing real authentic content, your real authentic stories. So you don't want to pepper a paragraph of, of, of your writing with hashtag this and hashtag that you don't want it to be disruptive to your message and to your reader. So it's, I recommend usually three to five hashtags. If you put one in there that in, in your content, that's fine. Otherwise just maybe skip a line or two and put it at the bottom. You can definitely look around and see what kind of hashtags fit for you. LinkedIn, as soon as you, you know, do a search and write in hashtag and start a, a word, it'll show you the top ones within that word. So within that start with that word. Um, so let's say, you know, for me, we're in obviously publishing. So we can look at, I can just do hashtag PUB and see what the, the, the most trending hashtags are. Um, if you're writing about something really, really specific, I, I tend to talk a lot about leadership. Posting hashtag leadership sometimes does okay, but obviously that's a really flooded place. So sometimes maybe with something like that, I'll try and drill down into a more specific hashtag, doing a combo of really broad terms and then some more specific terms is a good idea, but people, I follow hashtags. I, I like to see what's going on within not just industries, but, you know, drill down further within, you know, content and messaging. So you can see that, I don't know the number for leadership, but man, if you look that up, you'll see millions of people follow that hashtag. And therefore, if you hashtag that, you're going to show up in that feed and you're going to show up in those people's feeds when, when LinkedIn sees you as a creator. So again, it's a great way to expand your footprint beyond your connections. And also, also you mentioned that following hashtags, I follow a specific hashtag called IRS, not ABC, because that's about the changing laws for independent contractors. So that stuff shows up in my feed. And it's, so it's a great way to also expand my audience and knowledge of a, of a topic as well, but you're right. It does have to be more specific than just. Absolutely. Leadership. That's thank you for mentioning that. That's a really, you know, that's a specific one that's on your radar. Mm -hmm. There's going to be less traffic there. It might show that only a few thousand people follow that, but therefore that's an opportunity of a place to be a thought leader. When you see that and you know, you're engaged with that content, you know, other people are as well. So if you write on that topic and you hashtag that, that that's a place where LinkedIn is, is probably hungry for content. 
And so they'll push your content out more to a wider audience than say for hashtag leadership. So I'm going to double back to Nancy's question in the, in the, in the chat. What do you recommend in terms of using content you've already created? So she has a podcast and would like to leverage that more on LinkedIn. What would be the best way to do that? Great. Great question. I am a huge, huge fan of repurposing content, um, bringing it to a new audience, giving it a new angle. The fact that you have a podcast is fantastic. You're doing it. You're, you're, you've got all of this stuff. Um, podcasts, oh, I'm, I love this question because that gives you also the ability to tag everyone you talk to, um, to, um, to share the different messages and different perspectives of other people. And if, if anyone that you're interviewing, if they're a thought leader, then that's a really great way, again, to expand your waves out. But there's lots of ways to share content. So let's say with every podcast, your goal is to create at least five pieces of content. One, of course, you're going to share it as an event upcoming. Here's who I'm speaking with. You might even share that more than once. I'm so excited for this conversation. Get people engaged with it beforehand. After a recap, here's the, the three takeaways I got. This person was fantastic. You maybe do a picture of them, something that's really focused on them, tagging them, giving them something to share and be proud of because if you want them to reshare it, that's hugely valuable to you. Maybe a third piece of content is a quote tile from something that they said that's really, really valuable. This was what I take away, something graphic that gets people's attention. Um, you can then also as a fourth, maybe share a snippet, a video snippet or a sound snippet. Um, there's some really dynamic sound snippet and video snippet um, templates out there. And I'll tell you uh, someone to look at on LinkedIn who does this really, really well. Um, his name is John Corcoran and he runs a company called Rise25. And he runs a company that helps people create podcasts. So he's really good at this because he does the production. But he also, they also have a Rise25 podcast. He's someone just to look at for best practices because I mean, they do, they do it so well, but um, essentially you can turn every podcast into at least five pieces. You could also do a transcript, um, get, you know, do a transcript, can, sorry, transcription of your, of the podcast, and then turn that, have someone clean it up and turn that into an article and link to that article. Um, so many ways to repurpose content. And th that's the goal, right? Is to, is to extend the value of every piece of content that you create because creating content is hard and it takes a lot of time and effort. So squeeze everything you can out of what you're doing. So an unrelated question, so shifting gears a little bit. What about automating connections and or messaging to prospects? Is that a good idea or is not right. so much? So, so you gotta be careful, right? Because LinkedIn doesn't want you to do that. So if um, there are, Plenty of sites out there that do that automation and they, it may work fine, but you may get dinged for it. So I always want to say that we do handle the engagement for a lot of our clients. We have an engagement package and we'll say, we'll, we'll do that search every day. We do that by hand because it, it is dangerous to have it automated. Um, in the same way, be careful if you, if you um, outsource to a VA, LinkedIn, if they see you signing in from two different countries, that, that can ding you, you can get your profile suspended. So you gotta be really careful to play within their rules. They're, uh, they can come down on you hard fast. So, so you know, but I, I think that um, if you find a service that you feel like you can trust, then, and they seem like they're doing it well within LinkedIn's best practices, you certainly can automate it. Um, we've tried different things for people and we've heard stories from other folks who also do a lot of LinkedIn work and it's, it's dicey. So I would say proceed with caution, um, but that doesn't mean you you have to do it. You can certainly find um, find someone either on your team or find a VA to help you make this happen every day. I'm a huge fan of automation. I just always want to to tell people you got to be careful because LinkedIn is trying to root out all of the people that game the system. Somebody mentioned in the comments this still seems like a full time job. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So I. Again, that's why with the questions like, like posting on, like um, creating LinkedIn articles and newsletters and videos, if you can do all that, that is great. But I don't want you to feel like you have to do all that because the most impactful thing you can do is just write your stories out, 
share a couple of things, share a couple of quotes, get yourself out there a couple times a week, put it into a system like Later or Sendable or Hootsuite and, and share on a regular basis. Just even starting with that one thing, with that one layer, um, I think will have an immediate impact. I know for our clients and, and for other CEOs and executives that I have recommended this to, they're wowed, wowed by how much this has affected their business. Um, people also like to do business with people they know. This gives you an opportunity to share more of yourself and make yourself, um, you know, increase that, that trust, that know, like, and trust. Look, things have changed so much over the past few years. And before the pandemic, there was really the sense like you had to be in person. There's been a huge shift and it happened fast, but right now people are much more comfortable making connections online and, and, and creating community online. And that's what LinkedIn is all about. That's what they're trying to leverage is, is creating that trust. So really using it to your advantage is worthwhile. I think the key takeaways there are be authentic, do it in tiny little uh, chunks. Mm -hmm. And what somebody said here, snackable content. Yes. And uh, my golden rule rule is APV, always provide value. Like you said, give it away for free. Give it away for free. Give people, like when I, like my idea with this is what do you guys want to know? What's going to make this easier for you, right? Like it's not a black box or if it is, we know how to, how to navigate it. Here's all the tips and tricks we know. Share it, share your knowledge because like you just said, this sounds really hard, right? So what you do, what each of you do probably sounds really, really hard to someone who isn't in that business. So the more you share and say, this is the knowledge I have, that it's not, they're not gonna steal it from you. Like they're very unlikely to go and be like, all right, now I have all their information. I'm gonna go create what they do. They're more likely to go, I should just hire them. That sounds hard. You know? <laughs> they, they seem like they really know what they're talking about. Um, so, so speaking of that, there's a couple of questions specifically for you, Jennifer. Uh, do you offer a short tutorial, either self-paced or instructor-led on getting started with all of this? So not beyond these kinds of conversations yet, guys, I would love to do that one day. And I appreciate that question. Um, and Liz, maybe that's something that we, you know, we talk about doing is, is more of a facilitated uh, version of this. I know, Liz, you have run other workshops where you really walk people through how to optimize their profile, um, how to make sure their messaging is right, and they really understand their core audience. So I know that Pika has really great resources for that, and I would be thrilled to come back and do more of that. <laughs> Perfect lead into that slide, which Thank I you. didn't know was there, so you guys should know that was not on purpose. But um, I, I've seen that Liz creates, Liz and her team create a tremendous amount of material like this. So um, they are out there. We do full full service for our clients who are looking to offload this. That's not what this conversation is about. I think you guys, so many of you have the, the ability to do this and I wanna support that in any way I can. But there is a question about what services your business does offer. Uh, is there a business, is there a service that you offer to people like us solopreneurs? Yes, <laughs> well, absolutely. But you know, again, that's, that's not what I, I, I wanna make sure you guys have all the tools to do this, but of course, we write content for, for everyone. Um, we write blog content, we write social, we, we, for the, for the folks that really say it's not for me, I don't want to sit and do this. I want to hand this off. I see the value, but it's going to take way too much of my time. Um, and I need to focus on business development in other ways, or I'm just so slammed with work, which is a great problem to have. And I want to expand my network at the same time. Um, then we, you know, we fully manage campaigns. We have strategists, that ask the questions, that pick your brains, um, that get your stories and, and really work to understand your voice and your tone and then translate that into content, so. So which of your two businesses would be more pro applicable to us? Is it elite authors or elite editing? It's all, it's all elite editing. So elite editing is all B2B writing and editing. So it's all about understanding an individual or an organization's voice and translating that into written content. Um, elite the, authors- What's the URL for Elite Editing? EliteEditing.com. Yep. Or honestly, ping me on LinkedIn. That's where I am. <laughs> if you want to chat, I'm always happy to. And that's the best place to find me. Okay. Well, we've gone a little bit over time, Jennifer. It is, obviously, there's a lot of questions and a lot more that we could talk about on this topic. But I wanted to thank you again for taking your time to volunteer to help us out with this sort of stuff. Because it's, 
it can be overwhelming for sure. Absolutely. You, you've, you've done such a good job of this for you, yourself and your own business and your clients. Thank you. For Absolutely. Sharing. Well, thank you. I, I love talking about this. Liz knows this. I love talking to fellow entrepreneurs. I, I love when people take that leap. Uh, we're all doing it together. And if I can be of a help to any of you, if you just want to have a conversation, I really can't, can't say enough that I'm thrilled to do it. So um, if anyone wants to continue the conversation, feel free to reach out and we'll find ways to chat or work together. I'll include your uh, LinkedIn uh, and Twitter accounts and the follow-up email. And so there's some questions coming in up. Will, will we get the video? Will we get, well, there really wasn't any slides, but yes, I'll send both. <laughs> um, it, probably tomorrow because it takes my assistant Marissa about 24 hours to get it uploaded to YouTube okay. and whatever. But uh, thanks again, Jennifer, since like somebody already sent you a connection request. So <laughs> right, yeah, connect with me. Let's definitely connect with me. That's the best, the best way to see, you know, what you're doing, what I'm doing. So I look forward to that. And thank you guys. Perfect. Thanks again, Jennifer. Thanks everybody for participating in all your questions. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.